Well, hello, church. I'm just going to read a passage to you that terrified me when I was a boy. Uh, sometimes it terrifies me even today, but not as much as it did before. That's in Romans chapter 9. I can remember when the preacher read it, and he'd probably read it several times, to be honest, but I can remember when it really sunk in, what I was hearing, and I could not wrap my head around this at all. Can you wrap your head around Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 4? I speak the truth in Christ. We'll see in a minute why he has to say, no, this is the absolute truth. I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. What? Paul is saying that if he could, if this was the only way to do it, he would be lost forever so that his people, his, his, his nation of Israel would be saved. I want to ask you about that for a moment. <clears throat> when I was a boy, they preached on hell a lot. Seemed to be very, very interested in it. But this, um, you know, by, by the time I was eight or nine years old and this hit me, we were already full-blown spiritual paranoids. And so whenever, whenever Paul says he'd go to hell, if that would save everyone else I kept thinking whoa because hell's forever we were taught that it was you know after you know 100 trillion years it wasn't that long in hell because you're going to be there for as long as God's alive you know that's and I'm going you know if, if there was a time limit on it like I'd go to hell for 10 minutes you know or I'd go to hell for a, a year you know, who would do that but forever I'm I think we got the idea of hell all wrong and if you want to, you can go to the Monday Morning Messages and look. I believe it's a six-episode six episode series I did on hell. Uh, and maybe I'll need to do some sermons on that to kind of help people understand. But that's beside the point. Think of that. That kind of love that Paul had for his people. That's a rare love. That's amazing love. But it's not the only example we have of this. Moses was a very interesting fellow. Seems to have been rather irascible, uh, moody. Might not have been a, the most empathetic individual. Might have been a very difficult person to work with, to be honest. He wasn't a cartoon, but he was an 80-year-old man. He would, earlier, when he was 40, he was brave and strong and had defended one of his countrymen to the point where he struck the guy that was beating him. And the guy that he struck died, and he had to run. He had to run. Uh, the, the government was not going to understand the right of self-defense. Or, or In fact, most governments back then had no concept of that. Some still have no concept of that. So he had to run. Along the way, he was brave. He found a bunch of um, you know, Arab tra um, caravans, people, you know, these nomads, harassing a bunch of women at, at a well. He jumps off. He fights them. He's good at this. He drives them off. The women are quite impressed, and one of them, in fact, says, I'd like to take you home and introduce you to my dad, and she becomes his wife. But that was 40 years before. Now, he is gone, and he has pulled the people out of Egypt by God's miracles, by God's hands, and God's love, and his guidance. But he was still Moses. Yeah, he wasn't much of a fighter anymore, but he was still difficult. He could be famously quick with his temper. He was old and didn't seem to like people very much. I'm not trying to insult him. Because you see, while he didn't like them, it is obvious that he did love them. Work on that for a while. See if you can get your head around that. See, loving people doesn't mean that you're sweet and cuddly. Sometimes it means that you're a soldier. Sometimes it means that you're rather fierce rather like the British system until really just over a century or so ago, 
was that if you wanted to be an officer, you had to be of a certain gentleman class and you would buy your rank. Yeah, pretty horrible idea. So you would have almost no concept of how to go to war, lead men or whatever, which explains an awful lot of the, uh, the losses that were taken. Among the conscripts and among the, they would call them volunteers, but I won't go into it. They're pretty much roped into it. If you're enlisted and you wanted to move up from private to corporal or corporal to sergeant, the only way to do that is if there was a hole in the ranks. In other words, if the sergeant died, then they could bring up another sergeant for that company. Except, except for one, if they were assailing, a, generally speaking, a fortified area, like the British wars in India, uh, Please remember, the cannon back then weren't going to do much damage unless you had several months to use the cannon there. And so whenever you finally did make a hole somewhere, then you had to stop because you, you, you couldn't just bring down all the walls. Instead, you would send the men in. Now, the first people going in are going to get killed because they're narrowly being focused into the one hole, and that's where all the fire is coming. In fact, police officers call doors vertical coffins because that's where all the fire is, is um, concentrated. But if you volunteered to be one of the group, to go in first, to lay the ladders, call through the hole, whatever it was, that group had a name called the Forlorn Hope. Because in other words, there's no hope, but they still have hope. If you survived, you could be granted rank even if the, uh, another person ahead of you in, in rank hadn't died. So that was the only way to advance other than to wait for somebody else to die. God called out for the people who have a forlorn hope for others. In Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 30, he prays for the one who will go stand in the gap for his friends. Go put himself on the line. Put herself on the line right where all the fire is directed, take it so that others can live. See, Jesus dying for us was not just to die for us and forgive us of our sins. It was not just to defeat death, but man, we're really glad it did. It was also to show us an example, not to love our life so much as to shrink from death. Put yourself in the gap for others. John chapter 13 one of the best known stories in the New Testament, if I may be so bold to say, however, one of the least applied stories. In John chapter 1 verse, uh, I'm sorry, John chapter 13 verses 1 through 17. It is the night in which Jesus will be betrayed. They are getting ready for the Passover supper. And all these men have come in from their long travels, barefoot, maybe sandals. They are, they're dirty. They're hot. They're sweaty. And before you lay down at table and eat, you're, you're supposed to have your feet washed. Get those things clean. And by washing your feet, you also go through the ritual of washing your hands. But none of them wanted to do that for the others because to them, washing feet was for the lowest class servant in the room. And none of them wanted to be the lowest class servant in the room. Now, we can look at them and, you know, tut, tut all day and shake our heads in disapproval. But the fact is, most of us don't want to be the lowest servant in the room. And we find ways to not be. Jesus looks around without a word, grabs a basin and a towel, and starts washing their feet. I find it highly remarkable. He didn't say anything. You know there may have been tension in the room because shame, yeah, um, here's, here's their boss, their rabbi, the son of Almighty God, and he's going around washing our feet. Now, I would, have, I would assume everybody would have said, no, 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 Jesus, we're sorry, we're sorry. You know, look at us, we're being idiots. Um, we'll, we'll take care of this. They didn't do it. And that's, I, I gotta ask you why. Why didn't they do that? Sit around and think about it. It's important if you really want to know a Jesus story that you put yourself in the story and you ask why what happened happened, but also 
what didn't happen and why that didn't. I think it's because the look on Jesus' face is that little bit of anger, disgust. And I think probably he washed their feet with a bit more enthusiasm than maybe it required. You know, grabbing it, whoomph. And by the time he got to Peter, Peter can't help himself. Peter's going to say something. He goes, no, 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 Lord, I can't let you wash my feet. Notice that he didn't leap out there to say, let me wash your feet instead. Yeah, he's still a human being. Human beings say stupid things and we have stupid attitudes. We just, we do. Jesus knows that. But when Peter says to him, no, I won't let you wash my feet. Jesus says, if I can't wash your feet, I want nothing to do with you. Whoa. See, Jesus was peeved. Had every right to be. In a matter of hours, he's going to be beaten, whipped, humiliated for a day, and then killed on a cross for these people that can't get off the rear ends and wash each other's feet with any, any humility or love for one another. Peter goes, okay, then you can wash everything. Wash, whatever. You... And Jesus goes, feet's enough. He's not, willing, he's not going to do the rest. Whenever he was done, he sat back and he said, did you see what I did for you? Now, their response basically is you washed their feet. No, you know, congratulations on getting a master's degree and how to miss the point. He said, the greatest among you has to be the servant. Has to be the one that puts themselves in the gap in Ezekiel terms. Or like Moses, whenever God was fed up with Israel and said, I think I'm just going to wipe this out or forget them. I'm going to raise up a new nation through you. And Moses said, no. He said, if you want to wipe them out, you have to wipe me out too. Because I don't want to be here without them. Even though he was difficult. That's in Exodus 32, by the way, verses 30 through 32. Just like Paul, Moses said, I would rather be wiped out and face condemnation than to let my people face condemnation. The forlorn hope, I would rather stand in the gap and take the fire than let my friends die. The same with Jesus. If you are the greatest, you are the one who gets down with the basin and the towel and you do the work nobody else wants to do because it's for people and you love the people. I truly believe that we are called to be the washers, not the washed. We are called to be the first to move when we see a need. In this year, which is yet another in a series of endless political years, we have far too much become comfortable with the idea of there is a need. Let's find a way to put that on the government to fix that. Somebody should make a rule. Somebody should make a law. Where are these agencies? These people need to be helping these people. When Jesus said, you see the need, look for the need. And when you see the need, you move. You take care of the need. We are not asked to sit back and complain that our needs have not been met. In fact, there is nowhere in Scripture where that attitude is acceptable to God. Genesis all the way through to the book of Maps or whatever it's the end of your Bible, there is not a single instance where someone sat back and talked about their needs not being met and God goes, oh, you know, you have an excellent point here. Let's meet your needs. Never. Some people ask why Cammie and I do what we do, even though we've got a little bit of age on us. Both of us have physical issues that we deal with. And to be very honest, we don't understand those kind of questions. We never have. I think it's because of the grace of God giving us teachers that says, if you have a headache, you still stand in the gap. If your knees are hurting as much as you can, stand in the gap. You might have to do it metaphorically because you can't stand up, but you do what you can with what you've got with the people in front of you. Think about this. 
Jesus did lots of miracles, didn't he? Impressive stuff. What miracle did Jesus ever do to make his life easier? Not a one. He used his power to make other people's lives easier or possible, raising them from the dead. He didn't do that for himself. There was a moment that happened shortly after the washing of feet. You would have thought that washing the feet, got it. All right, now we're, we're good now, Jesus. Thank you for showing us something that we had all missed. But no, Luke chapter 22, starting at verse 24. And I turned too far. I knew I would. A dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be greatest. They were still... I guess in some ways we could say they were still being men because men do that. Men fight for rank, position, and power. And I think women do as well, but they do it in such another way that it's not as obvious as the competition that men put upon themselves. So uh, ladies, if you want to call us all, all silly and these guys silly, fair enough. But somewhere deep in our hearts, we all have this disease of wanting to be looked upon as special and as um, important enough to be served. A dispute arose. Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them and those who exercise authority over themselves call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Now, if you don't catch what Jesus said, he said, the rulers of the world will go around saying, I will do this over you and make these rules and the like because I love you and I'm doing this for your benefit. That's what government has always done. Stepped in and said, you know, you know, because I love you, here are the rules. And I'm going to do this, and I'm going to take this, and I'm going to modify this, and I'm going to keep you from going here. I'm going to make you go this way. All of it, and it's all for your own good. And Jesus says, that doesn't happen among us. Christians do not behave that way. How many church leaderships need to go back and read this? How many Christians need to go back and read this and realize we're the washers. We're not the ones calling to be washed. In fact, he goes further. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater? The one who's at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who's at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who stood by me in my trials and I confer on you a kingdom just as my father conferred on me. You're given a kingdom. I've been given a kingdom. You have been too. So how do we advance it? Oh, pop quiz. How did Jesus advance his kingdom? Through service. Loving, consistent service. It's no wonder we don't get this. The world works very hard to make sure that we don't get this. If you've ever boarded a plane, you know that membership counts for something. First class and silver elite and then a diamond. There are so many of those that sometimes you can look at your ticket and it might say gold status. And you're thinking, woohoo, and you're like the fourth or fifth group to go. Because, well, you know, there's double diamond, triple diamond, and then there's diamond with a line under it and a smiley face and, you know, They'll, they'll let you see your rank. Even though it has been shown again and again and again, it is, it is perhaps the least efficient way to board an airplane. People demand it because they want the status. Jesus didn't die to make you a member with privileges. He died because he loved you so much, he stood in the gap for you and then said, if you love me, do this. And do it for each other. Live a life of sacrifice. He's the mediator, but he called us, as we talked about last week, uh, or sometime down the road, whenever we went through Acts chapter 3, uh, that we are mobile temples, that we are priests on the road. We are there to serve and to see and serve. Let's get back to Paul for a moment and that frightening, terrifying passage of Romans chapter 9, 1 through 4. He was a lawyer. He was a top-ranking member of the Sanhedrin, and he was a Pharisee, basically the trifecta of somebody you would not expect to have great empathy 
for the lesser folk. But he did because he came into contact with Christ. And when you're truly in contact with Christ, it changes everything. He was happy to serve, happy to make tents, not asking for more. He dealt with sacrifice, with persecution, jail, humble surroundings, content with what he had, never demanded anything from anybody, never pulled rank on them. He spoke up for slaves. He trumpeted grace. He showed incredible persistence with some of the most obnoxious people and persistent sinners on this planet. And that makes no earthly sense. It really doesn't. But Paul warned us. He said, we're not going to be drunk with wine. We're going to be drunk with the Spirit. It's going to look so stupid to the world as if we're drunk on something. Because they can't find an explanation. That's when we give it to them. We have met the Christ. You know, we're very sloppy in our language. We have a great language. Um, but we're sloppy in it. We use the word love way too much to where it doesn't really seem to mean much. We, we love puppies. We love ice cream. We love warm days. We love our kids. Well, how do you rank all of that? Well, we can. But by using the same word, love, 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 sometimes it's hard to see. But love is something which must run deep in us. We no longer live or work on behalf of ourselves. Rather, we live and work on behalf of others. Anytime that you have ministers that are me, 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 look at me, 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 I need this, I need that, I need this, I need that, you, should, you might want to have your hand on a red flag because there's an issue there. But when ministers ask you, as we often do, some of you know because you've received an email or something or from the prayer wall, we'll say, how can we love you better? What can we do for you? How can we help this? You see, it's, it's not Ashley Brilliant. Now, if you don't know, Ashley Brilliant was a guy that came up with a lot of sayings, and they were little brilliant sayings. People put them on bumper stickers everywhere. They wore them as T-shirts, and they still do. One of his most famous was, practice random acts of kindness. I'm going to ask you to not do that. Do not let your kindness be random. Let it be planned, prepared. That when you wake up in the morning, you are already looking for opportunities to be kind. And yes, that means to the people in your own household. And yeah, if they're not kind back, what do you do? You wash their feet. You still serve. You stand in the gap. They may never see. They may never pay attention. They may never care. But your heavenly father sees it. And he has given you a kingdom because of it. Specific, intentional action that is based on what is best, not for us, but for them, emotionally, spiritually, and physically. It means interrupting our own self-centered agenda and picking up a cross and being willing to climb on it if that will save others. Romans 9, Exodus 32, John 13. Even when those others aren't pleasant to us or easy to work with, like in Romans 5 and verse 8, we do it. We do it. Now, I do want to stress that there is something missing in the descriptions of Jesus, Moses, and Paul in the situations in which we have found them. Feelings. We live in, an, in a world where we no longer say, I think, or it seems according to the available evidence, we say, I feel. And you, you said that, and I felt this, and I felt that. Your feelings do not trump facts, and they never will. Your feelings often are lies. They are lying to you. Your own feelings will lie to you. Feelings are not how we move through the planet. We have to have fact and decision and intention. Feelings are great, by the way. I love feelings. But they have to remain in their place and we understand what value they have and what value and power they do not possess. Moses was hard to get along with and didn't like people very much. And yet he loved them. 
And that love was not a feeling. That love was a decision. Paul's love for his people wasn't because every time he thought of the people of Israel, and he was one of them, that every time he thought of them, he just giggled with joy and couldn't help smiling. No, they had stoned him, thrown him in prison, some of them, the great bulk, no. They had mistreated him. They were hunting him down and were ultimately responsible for his death at the hands of Rome. So the feelings weren't part of it. He made a decision. Love. Because love is a decision we make. With the times that it has feelings, fantastic. But the decision stays when the feelings are not there. Here's the thing. We start off as selfish infants. We don't have to end up that way. We may have lousy childhoods. We don't have to be lousy adults. We can, we can make some decisions now. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, the Bible says, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. So we do that. That's what we do. We stand in the gap. We serve others. We do not sit saying, what about my needs? No, no, no. We have a kingdom. He's given us more than we could have ever asked for. Let's move. Moses knew it. He got that. Jesus tried to teach his apostles what it meant. And just before the end of the New Testament, John shows us he got it. John, 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. And we'll end this lesson with this. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. You have heard the charge from the one who learned it when his feet were washed on Passover night. We should listen to him. Look to our Father. Thank him for giving us the kingdom and then go stand in the gap. May God bless you and give you the strength to do so. We'll talk again soon.